Elevation Station, 132 Waldeboro Road in Jefferson, Maine. We have premium medicinal cannabis and accessories to get you on track. Elevation Station, 132 Waldeboro Road in Jefferson, Maine. All aboard! Hello everyone, my name is Ken Minot. I'm the general manager and promoter of Wiscasset Speedway and the president of the Maine Vintage Race Car Association. Uh, on behalf of MVRCA, Lincoln County Television, and our participating sponsors, I want to welcome you to this version of Vintage Racers Roundtable. Uh, this is the first of what we hope will be a series of programs where we gather together some of the legends of Maine auto racing, to share their stories and take a glance in the rearview mirror of their remarkable careers. Uh, we've got a great venue here, absolutely beautiful. We want to thank the folks from Owl's Head Transportation Museum for uh, hosting us today. We want to thank Director John Vitero and his staff uh, for all their generosity in letting us use this venue today. Um, our special guests today are three uh, of the most iconic race car drivers to come out of this, the state of Maine, specifically central Maine. Uh, tearing up tracks and collecting hundreds of checkered flags among them, mostly in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it tracks like Unity Raceway, Speedway 95, but also Wiscasset, Spud, Oxford, Beach Ridge, Exeter, and beyond, which what we'll find later on in this show. My co-host right here to my right is uh, no slouch himself. He is a Maine Motorsports Hall of Famer class of 2016 and a New England Auto Racing Hall of Famer class of 2018. Mr. Pete Silva here to join us today. So Pete, this was an idea we came up with uh, a few months back. We talked a little more at the Northeast Motorsports Expo and it's nice to be able to get these guys together today. I'm excited and I'm thankful for you, TV station, Vanessa, Richard for being willing to do this and moving it forward so fast. And I, like, as you said, we got a great group of guys here that have a tremendous amount of history in the state of Maine. Hall of Famers with hundreds of wins. I'm looking forward to hearing their story. What I don't know. I'm sure they're <laughs> gonna tell me things I don't know. Well, let's introduce you to these guys. Uh, first of all, to your right, we have a multi-time champion and Maine Motorsports Hall of Famer, class of 2006, Mr. Dana Graves from Bangor. Next to him, we in the center, we have a, a multi-time champion himself, a Maine Motorsports Hall of Famer, class of 2016, same class as you, uh, yes. Norris Willett. Thank you, Norris, for joining us from up in the Winslow area. And then over to Scow Hegan, we have another multi-time champion, Maine Motorsports Hall of Famer, class of 2007, Howard Fuzzy Holden. Howard uh, Fuzzy, welcome. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. So Pete, one of the reasons you're here is to kind of help us draw these stories out of these guys. You raced with these guys, uh, you followed their careers as well. We're going to dig into some kind of neat stuff today, but uh, kind of wanted to go around the table and talk to these guys first and find out how you got a steering wheel in your hand. So Fuzzy, we'll start with you if you don't mind. Oh boy. Uh, first of all, I asked you off camera, and maybe you can fill us in. Uh, your name's Howard, but how did you get the nickname Fuzzy? Don't know. Given, <laughs> given to me by my brother, and I think it's because I talked a lot back in the day. Back yeah. in the day. Yeah. But what, what put a steering wheel in your hand in the first place? How did you get into racing? Barry Lyons and I got an old 55, 54 Pontiac and went down. Back when you didn't have to pipe them up, you could go one week with just a seat belt on your end. That must have been like 56, must have been 56 or something. Yeah, you guys started your racing careers mostly in the, the mid, 50, mid to late 50s? Yeah. On the dirt. Yes. On the dirt, for sure. Dirt, half mile, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, mile. it was a half mile. You, you, they all started at Unity, and it was a half mile track. Yeah. Now, Norris, how about yourself? You're the, kind of the youngster among these, uh, this trio here. You got started a little later than these guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I built a, me and my brother built a car, Car 54. And uh, I ran it a couple of races, and I was fortunate enough to, I had a friend named Ricky Thibodeau, who was on Leon Page's pit crew. And he knew me pretty well, and I knew him and the family pretty well. And Leon was not feeling good one night, so he told uh, Leon, he said, let Norris try the car out. Well, luckily, I went out and I got second with it. In the next race, he let me race it again, and I got first. 
And then that same night I got first, Blaine Littlefield come along, Littlefield's apple orchard, and offered to buy the car if the driver would go with it. And that's how my story started. And there you were. Yeah. 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 And when did that start? Oh my gosh, about 64, 64 yeah. yeah. I would say 64, yeah. Now, did you have a brother that raced also? Uh, no, no, he built the car with me. Oh, okay. I had sons and grandsons that raced, but then they new newer, they're up to yeah. date here, you know. Now, Dana, you started back in the late 50s yourself. Oh, uh, yeah, Give us a yeah. story about how you got into racing. Uh, well, I, uh, there was a fellow, I lived in Levant, Maine, and uh, there was a guy out the garage, had a little car in the garage out there, and he had race cars, and I, I was about 12, and I really liked race cars, and I went with him all the time and everything, and pretty soon, I was up probably 14 or so, 15, he had a car he'd go to Unity with. So I went with him all the time. I followed his footsteps, and he wouldn't let me drive at first, but because uh, my mother didn't didn't really appreciate these this, these race cars. <laughs> so uh, after a while, I he let me drive once in a while. But in the meantime, Pete's father used to drive that car for him, George Silver. He drove the car, and that's why I, that's how I knew George and the family from Unity way back in the fifties, like fifty four or five somewhere in there. It was dirt track, it was a half mile old fairgrounds track. So as soon as I, I ran, and then I ran up to Exeter myself. I had a, oh, I bought an old junk car, wasn't any good, it didn't go very good, so I, uh, then we built a good car for Exeter, and we, we, we'd win up there once in a while. And, and uh, then we started going to Bangor and Unity and everywhere. Bangor opened up like 66. Mm -hmm. It was hot top, boy. It was a, it was a dream beside that dirt. <laughs> that dirt, I was following guys in the dust, didn't know where I was going. But uh, the, the the hot top was really good to me, and I adapted quick to it. And uh, I won quite a few races at Bangor, and then we went to Unity, and we won down there, and we, we went a lot of places. Yeah, went to Arundel, Maine, uh, Ellsworth, Maine. Now, you were pretty much a Ford guy, right? I was back in the old days. I was a Ford man, yeah. Well, how about you, Fuzzy? Where did what did you drive? Oh, two or three Fords, and then I got about five fifty-five Chevys. I ruined a couple of fifty-sevens, and I ended up with a fifty-seven Ford. Yeah. And I had a I had a full coupe thirty-six. I run down, must use it. And, and Norris, um, the Apple Blossom Special is probably the car you're most famous for. Yeah, for, purple, Ford. Yeah, purple yeah, and gray. You're Ford. always a Ford guy as well. Most of the time, all yeah. Yeah. Should have gone Chevy so I could keep up better, but yeah, <laughs> they went good. I had I had a good time. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned you asked Norris about his brother. One thing these guys all have in common, and myself, a dedicated brother. Fuzzy had his brother Ricky, who was a diehard. His brother Ernest. Yeah. His brother Bobby. Yeah. Bobby raced and won a lot of races. And I got a younger brother, too. Yeah. Usually it's family that gets yeah, you into was, that kind of trouble, yeah. huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had I had a good time. Now, I knew you you and Barry had been longtime friends, but I didn't realize your first racing venture was actually we were, a partnership you know, with Barry Lyons. That's we were cool. just dubbing around. Yeah. We, uh, I worked there putting up antennas back in the early 50s. For Lyons, was it called Lions music, music at the time? Yeah. Lyons music, yeah. yeah. We went to Jack, put up a lot in Jackman, cold job. So I, we've got you is, is starting around 57. Your first appearance in the newspapers was in a bomber class. You raced at Unity. Your best finish in 1960 was third to people you were close to, Chet Kenny and Barry Lyons. Yeah. Do you remember any of that? I remember, oh yes. Yeah. I remember Chet, for sure. And then the following year, you succeeded in winning your first race, 1961. Really? In the bomber, <laughs> really, the bomber division. <laughs> The following year, you won four races, so you're picking up momentum. Was that in a flathead powered coupe? Oh yeah, you got that down pretty good. I well, didn't think I ever. Thank God for Steve Pellerin and Ken Lane. Yes. I didn't think I had any did anything till the '69, maybe. But we're getting to a point here. Uh, in '63, you won five races, and then you dabbled in the modified division, moved up a division, and you won the modified race on Labor Day, the Labor Day Classic at Unity. So obviously you're picking up a lot of momentum. But the thing that blows my mind 
you're doing that, you're still basically in a learning curve, you're gaining momentum. And in 64, you pick up and head to Norwood Arena. Norwood Pretty full of the it? arena. <laughs> now listen, you're still, you're just gaining I wanted, momentum. I wanted to find out about this. So you're racing against Eddie Flemke, Fats Caruso, Leo Cleary. Right now, I, I mean, that's, that's like just coming to the cliff and jumping. And this is not anywhere near the Skowhegan area. This is no. Norwood, Massachusetts. No. What, yeah. what prompted you to drive all the way miles. down there? I don't know. Hey, well, I we had really this great don't. friend, sponsor, and supporter named Bill Wallace that was a pretty brilliant person. And I'm assuming he liked the bigger, better things. And he, I like moving along quicker than you did, probably. And I'm sure he probably pushed you or instigated that he, move. He, you know, he did the sound in Unity for years. Yeah. Years. There you go. I yeah. used to go down with them a lot. And so oh, I, could, I remember that. So yeah, I could yeah, get yeah, in the yeah, infield. Yes, yes. Yes. I was going to ask that. Yeah. But yeah, you knew a lot about flathead carburetors. Yeah, my father used to brag on him all the time. Yeah. George did. But I still, and you indicated on the way down, you weren't sure what created that. But to me, that's such a tremendous leap. I mean, you went from Flathead Ford on a dirt track against people you knew that were pretty good to an old route arena. And I mean, I don't know how many people in the audience know who Eddie Flemke is or Leo Cleary or Fats Caruso. And I'm sure Roland Lapierre was there. They're all famous. My God. Bill Slater. He's, Bill Slater. He's, he's I mean, my hero down there. What did that feel like? Wild Bill. Connecticut yes. Valley Rocket, they called him. Yeah, yeah. Right. Wild Bill, V8. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he had two cars. What was that V8. like? I mean, for me, to pull into Unity, and you guys are all a standard, was incredible. I mean, I was way out of my league. So what did you feel like going to Norwood Arena? I had a good seat to watch them race. That's about all I did. <laughs> <laughs> I run seventh or eighth, and they'd go by. And yeah. It's kind of fun to look out. I wouldn't know you could look right at them in there, you know. But you, you must have been somewhat competitive because Steve Pellerin posted a beautiful picture about three weeks ago. You going across the finish line and only losing the race by about a foot. Now, someone was there that I, this a friend of mine, I can't think of his name, that, that night. Yeah, but you had to run pretty well. You must have been pretty good with that, happy with that. Oh, geez, I guess. That's like winning the Daytona for yeah. me. <laughs> so how long did you stay there? Two years. Yeah. I raced Bangor two years and there two years. Now, you raced that car at Beach Ridge a little bit, too. Very little, yeah. Did you do well there with it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Those well, guys are pretty tough. The now only time the we raced there, we had we had a flat in it in that when we started. Just I thought you took the seven car. I thought that was a small block Chevy. It was, but it, we started out that originally had a flathead in it. Okay. So and then you put the small block Chevy in it. Yep. After afterwards, yeah, we just run it a few times with that flathead. Okay, I'm going to jump around a little bit, then we'll I come back so. and you will. Yeah. I hope yeah. so. Jumped, <laughs> jumped in a horse or something. So, Norris, you, you were, uh, like I said, probably a late starter compared to these people. Yes. But when you got going, I mean, you had a, obviously, I remember Leon Page a little bit, mm -hmm. built some really nice race cars. The story you told me on the way down, I didn't realize, because I always affiliate you with Blaine Littlefield and, and, and in the eight car, right, in the tremendous success, but that's actually Leon Page's car. Yep. Bl Blaine came and wanted to buy Leon's car, and the only way he would buy it is if the driver came with it. And like Nora said earlier, back then none of us had any money; we were all struggling. And it was like a, like winning a Powerball ticket, I would think, for you. So, how long did you race for Blaine? Ten, twelve years, at least. So you you won, at Bangor. Oh yeah. You won at Wiscasset. Yep. You won at Unity. Yep. You won a race at Oxford. You won a tremendous, I was going over the stats, you won a tremendous amount of 100 lap open races. You won one of those at each track. Yeah. I'd like to clarify something though. Oxford, I got disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For what? We had a slick on the right rear with a all the numbers ground off in it and all this running with street tires back then. Uh, I think you would run street tires, maybe a slick on the right front. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, back then. So they, we tried to sneak out, but they caught us going out the gate. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you wanted all those tracks. You won some of the Pine Tree Camp races. That, yes, that was one of my best races, actually. I mean, yeah. that's one I remember a lot because. But you got. Uh, uh, I, uh, after I won the race, I, Bob knows, because he donated X number of dollars to it. And I said, well, I said, I'm gonna, we're going to do donate our winnings 
to Pine Tree. Right. And I said, Bob's going to match my winnings. Well, he didn't like that too well because he's already donated, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of forced his hand. Yeah. So that was in, started in 67, and in 68, when you got rolling, you must have been driving Blaine's car then. Yes, I was. You won four features. First one was the 50-lap Pine Tree race. And then you won at Unity in a single weekend and Speedway 95 in September. And then you really started gaining momentum. momentum. In 69, you won the Unity Open, Memorial Day Classic, 50-lap of mid-season championship, 50-lap sportsman championship, Three races in eight days, August 17th at Unity, August 20th at 95, August 24th at Unity. Pretty good weekend. Yeah, we, we uh, for a while, we were running three tracks. Yeah, I was going to say, it wasn't uncommon for you guys to yeah. run three tracks on We'd a given weekend. We'd go to weekend. West Castle on Friday, and Saturday we at Unity, and Bangor on Sunday. Was it just load up the camper and go, or? No, we didn't have no camper. We no. just dragged the car. <laughs> and back then... Your car could race everywhere. Yeah. Tires, motors, carburetor. It wasn't like you had to have a track tire. Yeah, there was a particular yeah. motor, a particular carburetor. Now, if, if it was, they might have had a weight rule or something to dictate something, but you could just go. The tires lasted for half a season. Yeah. Mm. So you got to race and have a shot at making money. Actually, even though it didn't pay well, you had three times. When I three sold chances. my car, to, well, when Dick Whitney took it over that year, there. We was $1,000 ahead. Now, how many people was $1,000 ahead at the end of the year? Not very many. That Not was the now. only year we did that. But. Not now. <laughs> but those are three pretty different tracks that you have to adapt mm -hmm. to, yes. uh, especially West Cassidy is completely different than, than Unity or, or Bangor. I always loved West Cassidy. Even when I, way back when I was racing against Bill Bailey and Ken Seegers and all them guys, I yeah. just loved that track. And... Uh, Bangor was my hottest one because it seems to be the flattest one. It was the flattest and, one, And yes. it gave me a little more trouble, but I went good at Bangor, too. The, the car went good just about every way we went. I'd follow Fuzzy around most of the time. But. <laughs> Until about the last couple of laps. And he'd follow me up through and then pull out by he'd go. Because we, we was high on points, you know, back when Fuzzy and I was racing. And we'd have to start the rear, 35 cars. Yeah, jeez. We'd wait 10 laps. Because you know there's going to be a couple, three accidents right off quick. Everybody's pushing, you know. And then after about 10 laps, we'd start moving on the rear. And then we, I liked the outside, and Fuzzy liked the outside pretty well. We didn't need the inside. Everybody wanted the inside, so we made our cars go on the outside. Mm -hmm. And every lap, we'd pick off one or two, one or two. Pretty soon, we'd be up there somewhere in the front, you yeah, know. And then the haul out by one. Because, and like I was telling you early, Fuzzy, I could always tell, because he's had it hanging on that pipe. <laughs> one arm, he drove one hand all the time, hung on that pipe all the time. No, well, <laughs> keep me upright. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, is that a comfort thing? I, I've yeah, seen different drivers do that. So I've seen uh, kept him in the seat. Brian Robbins yeah. puts his kept hand up the on seat. the roof. No. The races. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, I bet you were hanging on to that pipe when Lou, you and Don Lavrosio did the barrel roll down I think the front I did, plus down I the think bay. the other arm was out the window when I was up there. So I'm like, Boy, that was a... Remember that accident, Dana? Oh, yeah. That was a, that you was a rolled big old, high. You that was a big old Chrysler. Yeah. You guys, yeah were rolling Dana, over, you guys were actually rolling over each other in the Dana air, weren't you? went right over the top of me. Yeah. It's a quick story down, a bit, down to West Castle that I, I never forgot. was Bill Bailey had the Dodge, and it was very fast, big motor. The Dirty 30. Oh, yeah. We'd start out, <laughs> and he'd be going, going, go by everybody, and he'd be out front. And he, I could see him in the mirror, uh, especially on the long races. And pretty soon, I see him start to drop back, drop back, because he'd blister his front tire. He'd go so fast that he'd blister the right front so heavy. We'd catch him and go by him, you know, and because I'd get alongside of him and I'd go, oh, when did I make him upset? <laughs> Give him a little wave on the way <laughs> like, by. Yeah, come on, I'd say. <laughs> he, we'd get in the pits and he'd say, don't you do that again, he says, you know. <laughs> one of the highlights I got here for you is you actually stopped one of his five race winning streaks. I don't know if you remember that, though. That must have been in Blaine's car also. Yeah. He had won five straight. and it, I don't, Probably there was a little bounty on it. They bounties Usually, back then. yeah. Yeah, that must have felt good. Yeah, I, I don't even remember doing it, but I, you know, it's one of those things that... Yeah, this would have been in 1970. Yeah. And, and, and First like I year was telling the boys on the way down. 1970, that's what it's... I enjoyed running second more than first because I love to make the person ahead of me nervous. You know what I'm saying? Running it, I mean, I'd get... A foot, foot and a half, right off his bumper, and stay right there, you know. And you, you could watch him in the mirror, and it was just, it was great, you know. Yeah. Of course, everybody wants to win, you know. I mean, if I could go there, I'd go there. But anyway. Well, all three of you did plenty of that. So I guess 
Dana Graves is the godfather of the group out of all four of us there. I don't know how many championships he won. Probably it'd be somewhere between six and nine. Probably, yeah. And the first one to win any races. So in the 50s, he started driving on the dirt. What were you, about three years old? <laughs> <laughs> I was about 16 or 17. I, I, I th really thought I was, you know, I could do anything. I was bulletproof. <laughs> I <think we> <laughs> so this, guy, this guy told me, he said, I'd like to have you drive my old car. And I did. Oh, they had these, uh, they'd cut the track down from a half mile to a third mile at Exeter. And they took all that excess dirt and they piled it up in places. Well, I got into one of those banks and got to that, rolled over to the next bank and got to that one. And about the third bank, my tongue was sticking out through my chin. Oh, geez. So now I got to go to the hospital. That was now, like... Now I'm up to uh, Dexter to the hospital. My mother's getting a call. She's got to come up to get me. Boy. I was about 17, maybe. So she said, there'll wow. be no more of this racing. So <laughs> I didn't race again until I was probably 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there. About two or three years off, she said, yeah. he won't be doing this anymore. Yeah, that didn't work well for her, did it? <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, she, she never went to any of my races either. That was tough. That straight away, I remember that. My George was barred from mm. Unity for a while for whatever reasons. And we used to George go to Exeter, and I was probably 12 or 13. And... That whole front straightaway, as you said, that excess dirt was like today's speed bumps. Yeah. Oh, and I, I can, I can over remember people getting into that and start doing end over ends down oh, the straightaway. Yeah. yeah. So that was the dirt. You wanted you wanted Exeter on the dirt. Mm-hmm. You wanted Ellsworth on that the was, dirt. No, that was that, that was asphalt. It was that first year. It was asphalt. Yeah, that so was you asphalt. Wanted, yeah. Did you ever race at Cherryfield? No. No. Okay, so you wanted Exeter. You wanted Ellsworth. You wanted Spud. You want it Unity? You want it Bangor? Yeah. Yeah, I never, I went to Arundel, but I never won down there. And, uh, and we used to run Oxford. Every time we had any money, we'd go to Oxford. But we didn't, didn't have much money. The first time, so the first time I saw you was probably in 66 or 7, and you showed up with a Ford, like I told you, it looked like it'd been in a demo derby. <laughs> but it was fast. Yeah. It was fast. And, and then the following year, Unity, you won four features at 95, at 95, two in a row. You won at Unity. You won the points championship at Unity that year. Probably. And it says right here that you won the first ever Ellsworth paved event. Mm -hmm. But the, you just started gaining tremendous momentum everywhere. I mean, you, you won the point championship again in 71 at Unity. You won it again 72 at Unity. Is there a year you won championships at both Bangor and Unity? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that yeah. was early 70s. I'll tell you who would know that is Charlie Sheehan. Yeah. But I, I, I believe I did. Yeah, I've, I know, I've won them both before. And, and like Norris, you, you seem to go on a rampage when in the opens there. You won a 100-lap open at Unity, another 100-lap open at Unity, another 100-lap open at, at Speedway 95. And then you get these things, nine feature wins at Unity. Three and seven, Speedway 99, three and 77, three and 1980, mid season championship. And yeah, you had a long career. You didn't hang it up. Oh my God. Early no, 80s. no I, I was around since late 50s to 90, 90 1990. I was going to say about uh, West Cassett, he used to come down and get a. See, Wilfred Cronk was really a, a uh, fan. He used to come to Unity with Bill Bailey and them guys every, every Saturday night, right, no. Fuzz? No. And when he got and he worked on that track and he was a worm digger really, yes. And he worked on that track and worked on it and got it all going after a while, and he'd pay us to come down. He'd give us gas money to come yeah. down, and we'd go. Wilford was an awful man. Yeah, he was. Yep. And uh, we'd run with Bill Bailey and them guys. Of course, we run with them all up to Unity, but uh, Wilford always wanted us to come down. We went a lot of times, and, and uh, but Wilford was a good guy and everything went, went well down there, but. Yeah, that was probably the 60s, 70s, I think, was one of the really good yep. days of, of racing. Yeah. Um, just because your ability to take your car to any track, you guys, these days, people are pretty well locked into their home track. But back then, you guys would see the same guy. You'd race against the same guys on several every different night. tracks that, every night. That's but a very... No, that, you know, uh, uh, Wilford was, you know, we had all those guys that, you know, we raced right, right against them all the time. Yes. And uh, that was good. It, Pete was around 
You know, I can remember when I first went down south and I went to work at Banjo's. They thought we raced about three weekends up here and it snowed the rest of the year. And, uh, <laughs> but and a lot of people don't realize, probably listening to this, when, when uh, Johnny Joseph and the Susi contractor out of Pittsfield, he built 95. Right. And every other Wednesday night, there would be a 100 lap open. I don't know if you even knew that. No. So then we'd go to Wiscasset or Bangor on Friday night, Unity Beach Ridge or Oxford on Sunday. I mean, Saturday, and then every Sunday, either Unity or Oxford or Wiscasset would have a 100 lap open. So you, I mean, it was like you could almost be a professional racer. It probably didn't pay enough, but I mean, you had a shot. Yeah. They ran 35 cars, too, all the time. Today, all they time. only have 15, 20 cars, the yeah. most, you know. Yeah. Good field of cars these days, oh, around had, we, 20. <laughs> when you, like Fuzzy will tell you, and Norris will tell you, when we started 35th or 6th in that race, you go, high point men started in the rear. Yes. By the time you got to third or fourth, you thought you was already there. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was always 30-something yeah, cars. Yeah, there was 30-something cars. Well, you know, they don't have that today. They don't hear of it, you know. Yeah. And when you talk about an open back then, mm. you know, it was like 250 caliber drivers. If you go to Unity, you'd have the, sometimes the Dragons would show up. Mm -hmm. Rosati. Yeah. You always had Homer Drew. You had... Uh, 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 Dave Dion, Dave Dion, uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff Taylor, Stevens. And that, Jeff Stevens, Jeff Stevens, and that little failing. I mean, you had a you had a Hall of Fame. Yeah. And once they said, when you put that group in there and make it thirty to thirty five cars, yeah, it, it was a tough it was tough sledding. So going back to what I said about, and I know not, he, you won some, but you two guys, you guys went on rampages there for a few years, won a hundred lap opens at all three of those tracks. Pretty incredible. So something else we talked about on the way down, and I don't know if people listening really realize that you had a couple of years there. You had driven Chevrolets after you left the Coupes, Ford Coupes, and built Chevrolets. You went to Oxford and bought a 57 Ford from Niles Gage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the and that was sort car. of like Ralph buying the kit car. Um, the rest of us, well. it was over for the yeah. rest of us. Changed I think. everything, did it? Well, he won like 17 races. I mean, how many races did you well, get that to win? Well, that car was good. Jesus, I guess it was. You know, uh, who would have bought that? The chicken farmer bought that off me. Ripley? Yeah. Doug Ripley. Yeah. Doug Ripley bought it. He bought that. a car off me once, too. Yeah. So, what possessed you to leave your Chevrolet? I know you and Niles must have been friends because you ended up winning a race at Oxford driving for him. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that part of the Triple Crown yeah. series. Well, his mechanic was the school bus mechanic for farming, and my brother was school bus, head of the school buses in Skowhegan, so they knew one another pretty well. What was his mechanic's name? John Johnson, I think. I think his last name was Johnson. Did he live in Wilton? They lived up on top of the hill. Well, somewhere is where the water runs uphill up there. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got one. Uh, oh, yeah. They started in 95, and uh, everybody came, you know, but Oxford send about five or six ringers over on us every week. Yeah. yeah they and they would win. Yeah. But as soon as I found out about D.I. Springs and carburetors and started winning a little once in a while, they'd let me win, I guess. After, after I found that out, they never came anymore. They, they went home, <laughs> stayed home. Yeah, I remember they Tiger White won a yeah. lot. Down yeah, there. there was a couple yeah. there. One, Brad Joseph had a friend there that came up all the time. They, I remember those guys. They were all driving Fords, mostly. Right. Yeah, they came up and dominated. Yeah, Billy Park, right we now. figured Fords handled the yeah. best, really. But the Ford motors weren't nothing. Them 292s and stuff. Oh. <laughs> Stop stepping on the wet sponge. <laughs> now back then you really didn't have to worry about purpose-built race cars. It was true stock no. car racing. That's really? right. We built our own parts. Yeah. Junk sure. pads. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It, it was mostly just set up and what you could put in it for an engine. Well, you had, they had motor rules, but yeah. we had, I, 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 I bought I bought rebuilt so I thought forward. Yeah, you could go to the pot store and buy yeah, right. a, or, the, or the dealership and buy camshafts for under twenty bucks. You know, there you with go. Solid yeah. lifters and uh, basically the rule it started with four street tires, but as it moved up after they got rid of the coupes, it was a slick on the right front and three street tires. Yeah. Right. Those guys while. were perched up so high on the right yeah. front, you could almost walk under them. So, Norris, you, not to bring anything up bad, but you must be a, <laughs> something else. You just liked to be in the close point races, didn't you? <laughs> you won one championship where they actually tied. You ran another championship, and I know it had to be tough to lose it. You lost that deal with 
between Bangor and Unity at a combined point. Remember that? Mm. For the Gremlin, you lost <clears throat> that by what, one point? Yeah. 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 That, had a flat tire for some reason. We didn't really figure it out, but oh. you know, them old big M and H slicks yeah. in the Things front. Things happen. Things happen. We can't, couldn't control them. You know, if you're 30 points behind, you can live with it. But when you lose the whole deal by one point, and you go back and think about a flat tire, yeah. yeah. How serious were you guys about points racing? Because these well, days, some guys just race for the checkered flag. Some play the game, and, and I didn't really care points. about it. And we, luckily, Blaine Littlefield didn't care about it really. Because I told him, I said, I'm not here to be like a winner all the time. I'm just here because I enjoyed racing mm -hmm. and I'll do the best I can. But if we got second or third, like I told you before, if I had this guy in front of me that I could worry him right to death, I loved it, you know? You put the gremlin in the mix, it becomes a bonus. It'd be like paying yeah. a few thousand dollars point money. So then, you know, once you know you're in the hunt, it becomes, obviously it gets serious and yeah. actually it drives you crazy. Yeah. You already know that. Everybody at this table does. Did you yeah. guys ever have any incidents between the two of you that, I mean, you're friends now, obviously, but did you ever have any scrapes against no, each other on the no, track? I never did with Dana, and I never did with Fuzzy. Never Not did. many. Uh, Me either. I had one little incident with Pete's crew. But Pete's father and I have been friends for ever since, for, uh, forever since I was a kid, 12, 14 years old. So One night, something happened anyway, and Pete, <laughs> Pete never said nothing. Pete's crew come over and all they started beating on my roof and this and that. They was, they, was pretty, they was pretty upset over it. So I got out. I had an altercation with one of them. <laughs> knocked, him, knocked him down a couple of times, you know, this and that. They don't want to admit it, but so, I'm pretty sure my father was paying him to rough me so, up every weekend. So, so, then, up. so then I said, Jesus, this is awful, you know. So next week, uh, Bob Knowles called me up to him. Bob said, Danny, you're coming back because he knew him. I, you know, I'd stay at Bangoff if, you know, if I didn't like it down there. So Bob Knowles called me up and said, you're coming back, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, I'll be back. So here we go down to Unity, getting ready to swing into the pit. And here's George, George Silva standing right side the gate. I said, oh, boy, George and I have been friends all my life. And now he's going to get rid of me, you know. I said, I'm going to have a problem. Well, I rolled down the window, and he stuck his hand right in and said, Dana, them boys of Peter's, he said, I, I'm sorry. He stuck his hand right in there. He said, there'll be no more fights. He said, I've told Peter. And he said, I didn't want to talk to you. And I said, there'll be no more fighting. And that's <laughs> the way it went. And him and I was friends every time. Picking Dana over me, you'd think I'd have a complex about <laughs> that. <laughs> he was quite a dude, they'll tell you. Well, we're, but Pete's car always went good. And we all, yeah. we had some good, good runs. You guys, you know, I like them a lot better now <laughs> that we're done. Because when I started, these guys were the standard. So I was, they were handing my butt to me every week. It's easy to be impressed with them now, sitting here and preparing to come here. And, and, and the history that what you three guys did is just phenomenal. And back to you. Oh, it must have felt good. You were the first guy to ever be inducted into the Unity Hall of Fame. I didn't realize that. Yeah, a long time. Very first guy. Now, I've got to ask another question. I don't want to embarrass you or anything, but... No, I bet. I've seen a lot, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a lot of people, pictures of Woodstock, and I've never seen you in any of them. No. Where in the world did flower power come from? Well, the, the, the 60s, flower Six. power. <laughs> uh -huh. was, was that on that car, Fuzzy? Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Where did that come from? Do I just... Assume? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you gotta you gotta use your imagination okay. on some of this stuff. <laughs> <Use your imagination. laughs> he got some. And I had a girl. I had a girl on the side. I remember a picture I of the remember girl that. with, a, the front with a stick of pulp yeah. over her shoulder yeah. and it said Paul Paula. Yes, I remember that now. How many races do you think you've won? I get no idea. Ten, maybe. Ten. Oh yeah, lots. A lot of them. Yeah. You won all the races. What do you think? You're all in triple digits, I'd say. I had 100 trophies at one time, but some were second, you know, and yeah. third, so I, I really don't know. But I had a lot of firsts. Yeah. I figured all three of you guys had to be in the triple digit bracket. You won a couple hundred. Yeah. I won quite a bit, and I, I, I gave all the trophies away. I think my wife got sick of dusting them. <laughs> <laughs> when Ken Lane went back and did the research, and, and sent it to me the first time he, on, on you guys' history. I had to call him back and say, you've got to downsize it. There was 138 pages of articles with you people in it. And the thing that struck me, other than the amount of wins,
the tremendous amount of times you guys finished in the top three and five together. All three of your names were just, you guys are like intertwined forever. Yeah, as far as success. Years there yeah, we, there yeah, were several right. years. Yeah. yeah. Several years, you guys were the standard. I've had Bob Knowles come and ask me if I, in, me and Fuzzy just like this on the pole, what, two or three or four laps to go, had the restart. Bob said, can you beat Fuzzy? I said, Geez, I doubt it. I'd beat him sometimes, and Fuzzy beat me a lot yeah. of times. Well, I had that one that picked the left. Picked That's the right. Left oh, front. that was dangerous. So I'd get that up right by your window there on the right yeah. hand side. Yeah, he drove on three wheels for about five years. <laughs> That's like what, this. That yeah. was a good car. Threw the weight back to the rear and didn't push him. Hey, good bite. Yeah. That's when I think everybody's car picked the left front up a little bit for a while. Yeah. We were learning about well, we wedge. We about put so much wheels. wedge in them, they were like tricycles back Well, the right then. tire was the only slick yeah. you had right. yes. we first right. started out. Yeah, so we had, it. it did yeah. all the work. Yeah. You know? yeah, we had it up so high that it was like leveraged to pick the left front <laughs> yeah. up there yeah. forever. Yeah. Fuzzy, we were low. he kept it up all the time. <laughs> so who was, uh, that was fun. who was the toughest guy you raced against? Who was, the, who was the kind of thorn in your side whenever you raced against him? Ralph probably was at the end when he had that kit car. Yeah. Ralph was tough. I used to follow him and Stan. They were beating each other. <laughs> Ralph bang, Nathan. bang, bang, all the way down the back straight. And uh, before it was over, I might win the race because they went off. Somebody said to me one time, this is kind of funny. Somebody said, uh, do you ever have much crashes at Unity? I said, Unity is the most fun place I ever raced in my life, but it's also the most worst place to run off. I've been out oh, yeah. to 139 through, through that bank, you know, through that fence, and I've been all the way to Albion, I think, down there, number four. <laughs> and, and then you got uh, that water hole on the other side, remember Puzzle yep. by the pit grandstand? Yeah. I've been down there, oh, I've been everywhere. But when you go off these places, the car's done. Yep. You gotta get another oh, yeah. car, another car. Yeah. Those banks, even though they were dirt banks and you think dirt being soft, those banks yeah. were tough. I'm sure you've hit them, you've hit them. It's, How about uh, you, Norris? Who was, uh, who's, who's been your nemesis to race against? <laughs> Stan was a... Yeah. Me and I had quite a few problems. Yeah, I, but, uh, yeah, I think what happens, and I, and I had to live it, and every one of these three had to live it, you go through fortunate enough to be in a position where you dominate a certain era. Right. And then the new guy comes. You know, and, and, and when he gets his footing, I mean, he, he's probably got more money. There's more technology out and more access to the things it takes to win, and that would be Stan and Ralph probably to a certain degree. Heavier yeah. foot. And yeah. Oh, yeah, you can't deny what thinking. those two accomplished. But, you know, it's... It does they, seem to be a recurring theme, though, that I've yes. talked to guys from your era. It's like we, we waited for Stan and, and, and Ralph to get their business taken care of, and then maybe you could sneak in and grab a win. That's right. They, That's they, the only way I could win if they went out. 90% of the people I raced against I go the outside of them and never worried me because I knew there was going to be where they belonged, you know? Yeah. If, if they, something happened, you know, they slid a little bit and it never was intentional. Yeah. Just it was just something driving. that happened by an accident, you know? Yeah. But very seldom did that ever happen, you know? And I'd like to say, you know, Bob Knowles used to always come in the pits and talk to us, all of us, yeah. you know? Good guy. And, and Bangor, <coughs> maybe I shouldn't say this, but never did. Nobody, no. nobody ever come and talk to no, you. No, that's right. You're right. Uh, West Castle, Kronk's all, always, always in. Come on down, have something to eat. Kronk. Blah, blah, blah. You know, nice and, guy. Kronk was a wonderful it's person. It's the same it is yeah. today, West Castle. The Kronk's. Yeah. I mean, the uh, Jordan's. You know, Jordans are doing an excellent job. Yeah, I mean, sure as far are. as that greeting people. Good. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I just can't believe how. It's, yeah. I wish I was younger so I could go in there and be in a real fast class, you know, on the racing and. and, and yeah. Be back. I, I see you there from time to time. Yeah. What do you What do you think about watching your grandson's race? Your, oh, your grandson so Kyle uh, so just fun. won a championship last year. Yes, he did. He did. It's uh, It's you can't explain. I can it. see the pride on your face. Oh you? yeah, you can't explain <laughs> yeah. it. You know. I even and brought a about, picture with me. What about race? <laughs> you get a chance to race uh, head to head with your grandson Caleb in the Vinta, Wicked Good Vintage Race. Yes, also. I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Must have been a thrill. And my son Mike, yep. he was out there for a while. Yep. He. Uh, we ran over him a couple of times, and he decided to get out of it. <laughs> yeah. You guys were running a, one of you guys was running a replica of an old Bob Halley car, yeah. right? That was my grandson, yeah. 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 yeah, Caleb, yeah. Him and I raced neck and neck a lot, a lot. I mean, and then his, the father that owned his car, Larry Ricker, was an excellent friend of mine. I mean, 
him and I was really tight. And that vintage race group was a good way for you to kind of scratch that itch a little bit more uh, to get out there and drive fast. But I, I hated to get out of it, but I had to, you know? Yeah. 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 Fuzzy, what about you? Uh, who was, uh, was it Dana that was your chief nemesis out there? Or was no, it? I don't know. I never had any problem with anybody, but uh, Moon Eyes used to run me pretty, pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> Down the front stretch, he'd, he'd get you out there sometimes where you'd kind of flop, Ron Lee. flop, flop over your own and back out. And when we'd be all done, we'd go in the pit and he'd say, do I give you enough room, Fuzzy? <laughs> do I give you enough room? Yeah, he's something else. Yeah. <laughs> I liked him. I, yeah. I had a lot of fun with him and everything, but he was, he was something else. He it's was funny how my, some of the, my turn, you're in. <laughs> it's funny how some of the races you, you race with, you get to know them, and you get to know what they're going to do, and, and it's so easy to race with them. It, it's, it's competition. You didn't back off, but you just knew where they was going to be. You knew what they was going to do. Well, you learn that. You know, one of the few things, George told me three things so he saw I was going to race. And... Oh, one of them was to always learn who you're racing against, study his habits, know what he's going to do. So you almost know what he's going to do before he does. Yeah. But that's basically the same thing. You knew what was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. You're on the same guys all the week. All your week, you know yeah. what they're doing. We'd go a couple laps, and if, if Ralph couldn't get going, he'd three wide on number one. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell one more story I got to tell you. Bob Knowles. Bob Knowles was a, quite a guy. He's a good promoter, really. He's a nice guy. Well, anyway, you know, uh, we, we could run Bangar all unity at the same time. They, and Bob always wanted us down there, so down we went. And we did well, but if we had a problem down there, when I come home from work Monday night, and Bob knows me sitting in my yard. He'd say, get, get a shower and get clothes on. He said, we're going over to Pilot's Grill and have supper. He'd take my, me and my wife over to supper every, every, every time we were there problem. He did it about yeah. three or four times in my life. Yep. Now I always forget, you know, I, I won't forget that. Yeah, I always knows. hear great stories about what a, what a good promoter Bob knows a nice guy. Yeah. He, he was kind of ahead of his time promoting yep. us. He used, there used to be a deal on the radio called the Town Crier or something that was free for events to have. <laughs> he, he never missed that. He was in the newspaper Monday, Friday, Saturday morning. He used every avenue. there Because he had Russ Longley. He hired George team. Hale after that. Yes, Russ Longley and George Hale, two great promoters and probably good advice too. But you're right, he was way ahead of his time. Mm. Did a good job. Bob Knowles a good guy. He said, I, I need you down there. He said, we need the Bangor crowd along with that Waterville outfit. <laughs> That's what he'd say. <laughs> Did you ever drive for anybody else besides your family and your own stuff? No. Miles at one time. Miles Gage, yeah. You won driving for him. Pardon? You won a race, you won one driving his car. Yes, in the triple crown. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people know you won at Oxford. I didn't know that. No, I didn't either. But I, so you drove, started with Leon, mm. then Blaine. Yeah. And then Jack Light. Jack Light's somebody everybody liked. I didn't, I just drove his car off and on because when he didn't want to drive that yeah. or something or other. His so I went for Dick Whitney for. Yeah. A couple of years. Okay, well, let's back up to Jack just for a second. Did you win races driving for him? Uh, up, you, to, up to uh, Spud? Spud Speedway. I won one up there with it. Yeah, I remember that car went well. Yeah, it did. And then at Unity, I, I won one at Unity with yep. it. But uh, I didn't drive it that many times because Jack drove it most of the time. Yeah. He just was, I, he wasn't scattered, but he just didn't, I don't know. He, <laughs> <laughs> he just wasn't a real good driver, I guess. He just liked to race and, you know. He loved racing. He, he liked being around. Yeah, he yeah. loved racing, and, and that car was available to anybody that had a problem. Oh, and, yes. And, and needed to chase points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up with Dick Whitney? Blaine Littlefield went to, <coughs> up to uh, Spud and ran Spud Speedway. For Bob. For Bob Knowles. So when he left, of course, I had no sponsor or nothing left because he took care of all of that. Yeah. So Dick Whitney... Blaine and Dick got talking, and Dick Whitney took me over, so I drove for him, and uh, we had a we had a good time. Yeah. It was it worked out real good. Nice man. Dick Very and Donna nice. loved. Yeah. Yeah. Dick and Donna both loved her. Yeah. And the whole family yeah. loved her. Nice yeah. people. Nice people. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, I had a good time with Dick. But they, and when Ralph got the kit car, I said, "Well, I told Dick, I said, you know, it's going to cost you about thirty thousand dollars next year for me to race for you." And I says, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I says, I like you too much. I said, I'm a thousand dollars ahead. I said, the car is yours. We'll see you. And I quit. 
Well, I don't, I, I'm not sure people understand, and, and, and I went through it with my father, and then when it was my time, I understood how tough it was it, is to leave your home team, your family team that you know everything about and the feeling, and then go drive for other teams that have their own ideas and their own setups and win. So you should feel proud of that. Uh, and, you you got to. Dick helped me a lot. Yeah. And, and he was a nice man. He'd lay on the floor under the car and his head be off the floor that high. And he's relaxed because all his bones were froze right together. Arthritis. Right? Yeah, he was a very but stiff person. Yeah, I could ask him for time. anything and he'd go get it. Yeah. But I wouldn't because I thought the world of him. He was a nice man. Him and Donald. Nice, yeah. They were so good to me, it was unreal. Nice. And so wasn't Blaine Littlefield and, his, and Norma. They, you know, out of 10 years or so, they cooked me a lot of meals. <laughs> yeah, that's, I just think that's a good feat because when I was a kid, probably in the mid 50s, George, when he didn't have a ride, we'd be at his mother's, grand, my grandmother's, and a <clears> phone <throat> would ring, jump, load me in the car, and we'd go to Unity, he'd jump in a car and win the race. Yep. Yeah. Go back the next week, he'd be a different car. Oh, he'd yeah. He'd be in a different car every week. I, I thought it was just easy. Then all of a sudden, when I wasn't, didn't have a ride and I was in the South and it was time to do it, it wasn't so easy. Wasn't I had a chance, easy. I'm bragging a little bit, but I had a chance uh, <laughs> way back when I was racing to uh, Rowles Bowen Alley up in Pittsfield. Yeah. Offered to sponsor me to go Na NASCAR North. And I wouldn't do it because I had a job yeah. and I had kids. You know what I mean? They had to be fed. Yeah. yeah. And I wouldn't get paid nothing for doing this, so I, I, did, I told I refused it, you know. Yeah, that's, it, it would have been a nice experience, but you are, ter a tremendous commitment. Yeah. At every level. Well, and you got five kids in, you yeah. know, in six years. Yeah, <laughs> I, I couldn't drive for nobody else. Yeah. I had other guys' cars, but I also had to go back to my own. What convinced you guys it was time to finally hang it up? That, that's a tough decision to make because mm. it's part of your life for so long. What, what convinced you it was time to give it up? My boy was born, 71. That put the end to it. He, really? Yeah, he didn't want me. Well, I don't know. It's been more, there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, things that go with working on a car. You don't get a lot of time at home sometimes. That's right. So. Yeah. yeah, it says you ran a limited schedule. I ran 71. Just 71 is exactly what it said. Yeah. Now, to you, <laughs> too cantankerous to drive for anybody anyways, but <laughs> well, his last couple of years, look at this, 84 to 86, 25 feature wins at Unity and Speedway 95, 11 feature wins in 84, 12 feature wins in 85, at least 24 feature wins at 95, and you won your last race but had an issue, but... I hate to, t I'm going to tease you a little bit. That was in a Chevrolet, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. A lot of people don't know that. Last, last five or six years, I had a Chevrolet. And, 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 your, and, and, your, ad, and your adversary yeah. built it for you. Uh, your adversary That's built right. it. Oh, Stan yeah. Reserve built it for him. Yeah, and then uh, he, and, and, and actually, I mean, I shouldn't brag about this, but my car went better than Stan's car did. <laughs> and uh, Harvey bought a car off Stan. He'd call up. Stan to say, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Stan said, Why don't you ask Dana? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't he wouldn't admit to it then. Yeah. But same thing, same question. What what prompted you to finally say it's time to, uh, to park I had it? I had a little issue with them guys over the bang all they didn't like my weight of the car. I was they said I was eight pounds on the weight and I was whomping them every week. And I had scales. My scales said I was all right. So after they got done weighing me I went to Dice Ass, the truck scales, they, they said I was all right. Then I went to the trash guy that saw your mountain down there, and they buy, wait, uh, they buy trash by the pound, and I was eight pounds over there. And uh, me and Baker never got along after that, and I said, ah, I guess not. Yeah. Basically won the last race he ever was in. Yeah. And I said, this is it. I don't, I don't now, want them more. Norris, you had the luxury, like I said, to, your competitive career ended relatively early, but you had the chance to race in the vintage club, so that must have helped a little bit. Oh, I loved it, yes. Yeah. Yes, my boy, my oldest boy, Mike, built my he, he put the money in the car. My youngest boy built it, and it was old school. We built the front rims, and we had the, you know, you know car set like this, like you was talking about. Right. And it went on. I found that I couldn't keep up, so I had to keep modifying, modifying all the time, even in wicked good racing to keep up, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but it's the same deal. The reason I got out of racing originally with Dick Whitney, like I said, was because they started buying them 
kit cars, you know. I just get so much money, you know. Yeah. yeah. And to me, that took the fun out of it because it's scientific. It was no more go to the junkyard. You had to buy your parts from the dealers that sold parts. For it them. definitely changed the landscaping forever. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to his question to you about getting done, that must have been tough because in 69, you won 11 features at Unity at least. You won two at 95. You won two at Wiscasa. And you won an invitational race at Spud Speedway just two summers before that. So it must have been hard to make you that. You I won that race at Spud. Stan and uh, Ralph. I think either Stan and Ralph were standing moon eyes just in front of me, and I was just kind of biding my time, and they were banging and smacking. Yeah. Pretty soon off they went. But you still won. I won. <laughs> I won three or four races down the Indy like that, watching Stan and Ralph. Yeah. They'd be going down the back stretch going, no. slapping no, each other right in the door. Stan was, Stan was <laughs> in the I, cost And I'd back yeah. off because I didn't want no part of it. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty again, soon they was off over the end and I was going. It's knowing who you're racing against. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You've got to run to the, you know these guys. Every week you know how they were going to do and what they were going to do. Yeah. Bob Knowles would tell me, he said, I shouldn't have played that up so much in the media, but boy, did it fill the bleachers. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, no, Bob knows how to do it. Yeah. Bob, Bob really, Bob was a good guy. He's a smart promoter. He knew how to get them. Yeah. His dad was good. Oh, that was quite a boy, wasn't he? he? Yeah. I, he said, uh, we ain't got no money tonight, boys. It's raining. He yeah, said, yeah, yeah. maybe we got $5 a piece. I'm like that. Oh, he had no holes. He used to get us in the infield. And yeah. He'd have a little meet, and he'd say, half of them guys went, come over the fence. <laughs> half of them people in the stands come over the fence. George would come home and say, he said, yeah. he, damn, he said, he wouldn't pay us. And I said, why? And he said, well, he'd say, look, it's a little cloudy up here. There's not going to be anybody in the bleachers. <laughs> Am I right in saying he had a pencil stripe suit on? Oh, yeah, yeah. And a, and a bow tie. And a hat. And, he, and, he, uh, yep. and a hat, a felt hat. And his, and his he, was a, he was really, he was a, a kindy guy. Well, he had he a really, carnival. Yeah, he had a Ferris wheel and everything right there. Yeah. He was a, that was a fairgrounds. In yeah. the, Bob, that's where Bob started, working with him on that's the carnival right. deal. They went around the state of Maine. Yeah, had and he had a yeah. place in Portland. Uh, yeah, a bar in Portland. They had a roller rink, too, I think, somewhere. Probably. He used to bring some of the waitresses with him every once in a while from Portland. <laughs> yeah, oh, 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 Ed knows a squad of dudes, I'll tell you that right yeah. now. He, he'd have a little meeting with us to tell us he didn't have no money. Bob said he'd do anything to make money. Yeah, he, he, that, he said that, if he wasn't afraid of guns, he probably would have been a bank robber. <laughs> that time you said your dad was uh, barred from Unity for a couple of days, he and Ed got together and he dressed up like a woman and went in a woman's race. You remember that? Yeah. And then he got out of the car and <laughs> he was barred from the track and he won the race. He dressed up like a woman. <laughs> yeah, he and Ed didn't get along a lot. Oh, Ed Because George had questionable motives a lot of times, too, yeah. I think. Well... <laughs> That Ed was awful. <laughs> he really was. <laughs> he put his hands in his pocket and tell you he didn't ever die. So Bob, he, he was jingling money too while he was doing that. <laughs> but he he brought racing to our part of the state for sure, and he made it live. I mean, he yeah. he actually built the first field of cars. I think he was paying somebody twenty bucks a whack to put roll cages in the cars, so we'd have a. He didn't have enough cars, so yeah. there'd be a field of cars. And yeah, it just, a lot of them come from Skowhegan back yeah, then. Yeah, it just expanded because from he, there. his nephew, Bob Knowles was his nephew. Yeah. And he was a good friend of my brother. He got a lot of them together to go down first. But I think his Connie ways, I know promoters back in those days used to be a little more shady than they oh. are now, but uh, yeah, that's what it took to keep it alive, I believe. Oh, and yeah, they, I and, do, and too. To keep yeah. it moving. And he used to bring that... Uh, Hell drivers all the time. Yeah, and, and then he brought that uh, Crash Moreau there in, and on 4th of July, and he'd blow himself up in a crate in the middle of the infield. <laughs> yeah. and, and we'd be, and then they had fireworks. We'd be down there till 2 o'clock in the morning before we got finished. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Oh. He would be down there till 2 o'clock in the morning because yeah. he had all that other stuff in there. He, would, he believed in entertaining. Oh, yeah. I mean, he'd shoot those guys. Hell, he had a cannon they shot a car out of one time there, didn't they? Yeah, they did something like that, yeah. Yeah. Then he always get the guys to go through the wall of fire and things like that. Yeah, you know? yeah motorcycles. Yeah. Motorcycles. Yeah. And, he, and he had the Harold Wilcox. He had the Harold Wilcox flip over right in the middle of, right, oh. in, right in the front of the grandstand. Yeah, that's what they said he used to pay. He paid, yeah, he paid him. If you flip, you'd get 25 bucks or something so like that. Give him a color right there, and that was it. George <laughs> said the same thing. He paid you five bucks to roll over, not 25, yeah. five bucks yeah. to roll over. <laughs> hit a pothole and roll over. 
excite the crowd. <laughs> yeah. What was your favorite track to race on? Unity was my favorite track. Yeah. It was the most fun, but it was the worst one if you went off. That was it. You had to get another car. <laughs> but that was the most fun I ever had right there. Yeah. I always loved West Cassette. Yeah. Even though I raced Unity a lot, I, I just, something about the way it was designed and yeah. stuff. I, I a just lot of West Cassette, nice, nice bank, yeah. you got room. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the car always went good there. Yeah. Even better than they did at Unity, you know. I think cars do go better at West Cassett than they do those other places because of the bank. That's yeah. my story right there. I that's right. Mine handled right out of the box at West yep. Cassett. Just wish it was built a little sooner, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember one of the second race they had. I seen cars that didn't go well on a flat track and go to a bank track. And that's go, right. Oh, yeah. 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 It's amazing what it ch the, ch the way it compressed the chassis or something like that. Yeah. Of course, we never changed nothing from track nope. to track back when I was racing. We just no. Whatever no, it was, it was, you know. Well, we didn't know any better. No, no right. No. <laughs> like I was telling you on the way up, I never heard of cast in Canva. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden, Joel taught me about that when I got into uh, Wicked Good Racing. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't believe the things I wish I'd known back then, you know. I think that's where Stan had a really good advantage when he came back yeah. from down south. He knew a lot more, I don't know how much, but obviously more than we did about front end adjustments and front end settings. Mm -hmm. That had to be tremendously I think beneficial, that. for sure. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's, Stan would build a car that was really good. Yeah. But to me, he was never a real, he was a good driver, but he was his own worst enemy. He'd get out front and he'd have to be a half a track ahead oh, yeah. and still go wide open. Yeah, he drove hard. Just, you know, rather than just run the race and, and enjoy it, he'd, and then half the time he'd go through the fence or something, you know? If I could get to him, I usually, I usually would win. Yeah. If I could get under him, you know, if I'd just get there. Yeah, catching him was he, tough, he, though, sometimes. He, yeah, because he'd, he'd be looking in the mirror watching you, and, you know, pretty soon if you got to him, he went wide every time. Yeah. Yeah. But he's a good, you know, I always liked Stan. I always got along good with him. I bought two or three cars off him. And uh, the cars went good and everything. But, I liked uh, him best of all when his car was broke down. <laughs> 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 well, guys, we could sit here and talk for yeah. hours, I imagine. And we've got some great stories, and, and we're going to wrap it up here in a little bit. But uh, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of comparing how racing was in your time versus what you're seeing these days. Obviously, back then, you go to a junkyard, you get a car, bar it up you know, get your parts and go racing. These days you have purpose-built race cars that come out of a, out of a, a fab shop and such. Uh, so what, do you think you guys could survive in this, in this racing world these days? I doubt it. Oh, yeah. I would not spend the money. I couldn't get in the car, I'm too stiff. Me either, I'm too fat. <laughs> <laughs> I really think I could, uh, seriously. But I'd, I'd, it's one of those things you'd have to set up by like Taylor or Burgess or somebody that and you'd have to spend a lot of money to do it. Yeah. But I, 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 I still feel like I could drive decent because I always, I don't know, I just, it's a feeling I have yeah, about right. racing. I just was yeah. always, the car always fit me, you know? Yep. Yeah. You, you basically had a fabricated car. That Fairlane you built was square tube, and that was a beautiful car. You had some really, all you guys had nice cars, but those, the Fairlane and the Mustang you yeah. built were beyond yeah. what we had going at the time, really. Yeah, that Mustang, uh, when it didn't break, it won. Yeah, that thing was a rocket. Oh, it was really something else. But that Fairlane was basically a NASCAR-style built car. I built car. it for NASCAR, no, and then I could never run it. Never could afford to go. Yeah. <laughs> you nice know, car. But it was heavy, too. That car was heavy. Well, all those cars were heavy back yeah, then. Yeah, you got to get, get... Ralph long. changed that with a kit car, too. Yeah, I weighed 3,300. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah you know, it's funny on that kit car, like everybody was saying, it changed how we did business, so to speak. But the first month, that car was terrible. Mm. Right. It you did well. It up. And I can remember showing up early with my Chevelle to practice one day, and the engineers were there from Petty's. And I guess the wheelbase when he bought that car was longer than what our rules were, and he cut the frame and shortened it. Ralph did that. And those that engineers saw that, and I think they were getting ready to walk away. I wish they had of. Yeah. And they said, well, we're here. We're staying. About four hours later, it was over for the rest of us. Yeah. Between Ralph, there, Ralph, was, Ralph was quite a guy. Yeah. There was Cassett and Bingo. I mean, he must have won 20 something races. Or I've seen him go by me on seven cylinders. Yeah. With that car. One, yeah, one cylinder. Yeah. One, yeah. It was a game one, changer you know, for sure. Yeah. yeah. First That's car how good disc, it went. Yeah. You know, yeah. go right by you. First car with disc brakes on the front. Yeah. yeah. And he could stop. Well, I never had brakes. You said, <laughs> you used the term purpose built car. Yeah. 
That's what it was. That car was built to compete with the GM products. Yeah. I had a good time one time doing this. I went yeah. down to the Petty Course. Nice. And a low speedway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, I had a ball doing it. Yeah. No, that, that sounds, I, anyone that's done that, I, I think, set a good time. Didn't go that fast, but back then I was doing, what, 131 miles an hour, yeah. and I had top speed of the day, which I felt pretty good about it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the guy, well, the people I was racing against were amateurs, all of them. What I'm saying is, nothing wrong with that, but this, I had a little more experience, so it was, I knew you had to turn the wheel a certain way and stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of them couldn't even take off from the start. They'd stall the cars. And <laughs> but anyway, I had a great time doing it. Yeah. My, my boy took me down there and did the whole thing. As, as we wrap up, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to steal something from another member of the, the Vintage Race Association board. Uh, Charlie Sanborn's got a podcast of his own, and he always wraps up the show with, his show with this question. Uh, what, what drew you to racing? Was it the car, the speed, the people, the friendships? What, if you could sum it up, what got you to the racetrack? What was your connection to racing? Well, I lived about a half a mile from Union Street, and the, the Levant Garage was Jim Sodermark from Kenduska. He rented that garage, and he always liked race cars. And he just come back from the south in the service. He was down in Virginia in the service. He just come back from the service. And, he got that garage, and I just loved everything he did. And I just watched that and watched yeah. that. I went everywhere with him, and that was the way it was. And I got hooked again. Almost every gas station back in those days had a race car around it, by the yeah. way. You're a little young for that, but they did. Yeah. A lot of them I did. remember really yeah. young yeah. that they, they had those. Yeah. But what, what made you need to be at a, race, at a racetrack? Well, probably back in school, I uh, was lousy at basketball, football baseball. I never was good at any of sports. And when I started driving, I found that I had a little bit of talent of doing that. And so it just drawed me right into it. I mean, and I, I just, I went back every week because I just loved the competition for one thing. And the people, the people were so, this, they really are good people in the reason. I mean, yeah. yeah. What was it for you, Fuzzy? Is it, is it the driving? Is it the friendships you've made? What? Well, when I was 12, so my brother, Ricky, the one that it helped me. He used to, uh, he, he did Chet Kenny. And so Chet's my. Chet was a racer from Skowhegan, a, a good racer from yeah, Skowhegan. Yeah. And so I used to go down with them every week. But they hauled the car in the back of an old dump truck. So I'd get in the car on the back of the dump truck and ride down. And so I didn't miss many races and I'd get into the pits for free because it was ducked down. <laughs> yeah. So that was the deal. I was uh, <laughs> really. They was good to me, he and my brother. They, yeah. they got me down there, or Bill Wallace did. Somebody. Couldn't get away, in no, a sense. Yeah. No, I can ask you the same question. I, I think, think it's obvious, George Silva. <laughs> yeah, it's your dad's fault. <laughs> yeah, well, he started racing in 1950, and I was probably going to the races sitting in somebody's lap before I was five years old, and it yeah. just, yeah. the whole family's. You know, and the other thing, we grew up, America was infatu infatuated with cars yes. in that era and speed, so I think it was, you know, American graffiti type deal, and I think it was really easy to come by, but, you know, you're right, and... Yeah. Well, I thank you guys all for being here today. Um, I know I know you guys well enough where we could sit here and trade stories for another forever, hour. Forever, yeah, um, yeah, forever. But uh, I, I really want to thank you guys, um, and I, I want to give you a second, just in closing, if, if you want to thank anybody specifically, just for... Uh, being a significant part of your career? Well, I guess I'd probably better thank Bob Knowles for helping us a lot. And uh, my brother, my yeah. brother Robert, he helped me all my life. And uh, I just guess I guess I was just hooked on it. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Me thank you for the, having us. Yeah. Me is going to be the little fields, you know? Yeah. Even though they're gone now, they were super with me. I mean, they, they, they did everything for me. They, Whatever they could do, they, they would do, you know. And his daughter went to one of my races down in West Cassett uh, in the Wicked Good Racing. And luckily that day I beat my grandson out by a few inches. And she said she, because she hadn't been for years, and she said that's probably the closest to what she can remember when she was young, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuzzy, who you want to thank? Ricky, brother Rick. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, he was a good guy. Yeah, he was. And that's exactly how I remember all three of you, with the people you just mentioned. I'll always remember that forever. Yeah. No, I won't think of anything else first. And of course, Dick Whitney. I should yeah. say something about him, too, because yeah, he did help right. me. But yeah. uh, uh, Pete, thank you for your uh, help with this as well. Uh, Thank you so much for being willing in the Jordans linking TV. I just think we were lucky that you guys jumped on board so quick and you just made it happen. And we're still here. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'd, love get, I'd love to get the three of you in a race car <laughs> this, this spring and, and just, just for a few more laps around a track. Uh, I'm thrilled that the three of you were willing to do this. Thank you. Every one of you has had an unbelievable career. You deserve all the recognition that you get. But it's super that people like you and the Jordans Take are willing it. to do this now yeah. for people that have has been. You know what I'm saying? Let's face it, we're, we're too old to race now. I mean, but it's just, you know, even though here we want to, yeah. you know. But, but some great stories and some great memories. And uh, thank you guys again. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Maine Vintage Race Car Association, we encourage you to go to our website, uh, mainevintagerace.org. There you can find out information on becoming a member. Uh, for less than a couple dollars a month, you can help us uh, fulfill our mission to preserve and present the history of racing in the state of Maine. It's a rich racing history, and this was just a small part of it today. So we hope you guys get a chance to check that out. I want to thank again the folks from the Owl's Head Transportation Museum for hosting us today. Uh, Larry Seidlinger and the crew from the, uh, from the uh, Lincoln County TV. And... Uh, our guests today, Norris Willett, Dana Graves, Fuzzy Holden, my co-host Pete Silva. Uh, also a big thank you to uh, racing historians Ken Lane and Steve Pellerin for oh, yes. helping us put this uh, information yes. together. Uh, Vanessa Jordan and the crew from Wiscasset Speedway for supporting this venture as well. This is the first in what we hope will be a, a few shows uh, called the Vintage Racers Roundtable. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Elevation Station, 132 Waldeboro Road in Jefferson, Maine. We have premium medicinal cannabis and accessories to get you on track. Elevation Station, 132 Waldeboro Road in Jefferson, Maine. All aboard!